Chapter 8 A House for Free The same fraud used for mortgages, the subject of money is a complex one and a subject that directly affects all of our lives from the cradle to the grave. Home ownership is one of the American dreams that we have all thought, but few will ever truly achieve. The following action at law concern the Federal Reserve notes and that relationship is as equal consideration for the purposes of a binding contract as related to a home mortgage. This knowledgeable uh, litigant won his home from the bank. Enjoy the story. The following is the memorandum of law submitted by Judge Mahoney in that case. It should have the effect of a cold water shower to your intellect and a sobering re relation of the gigantic fraud that has been fostered on the American people for the past 86 years. This case cannot be used as president, as the Supreme Court of Minnesota has reversed it. Not because the judge was wrong, they did not comment on his analysis of the law, but because they said his court did not have jurisdiction. They were, in my opinion, attempting to save this evil banking system from collapse. Judge, judges are not permitted to make a judgment if that judgment would create chaos in society. The Supreme Court of Minnesota in reversing this decision was merely maintaining the status quo. We the people as slaves and the bankers as the masters, anything else would be chaos as far as the government and bankers are concerned. State of Minnesota in Justice Court, County of Scott, Township of Credit River. Martin v. Mahoney, Justice. First Bank of Montgomery, Plaintiff, Case Number 19144, Judgment and Decree, um, versus Jerome Daly, Defendant. Above entitled action came on before the court and a jury of 12 on December 7, 1968, at 10 a.m. Plaintiff appeared by the President Lawrence versus Morgan and was represented by its counsel. Theodore R. Melby, defendant, appeared on his own behalf. A jury of talesmen were called, impaneled, and sworn to try the issue in this case. Lawrence v. Morgan was the only witness called for plaintiff and defendant testified as the only witness in his own behalf. Plaintiff brought this as a common law action for the recovery of the possession of Lot 19, Fairview Beach, Scott County, Minnesota. Plaintiff claimed title to the real property in question by foreclosure of a note and mortgage deed dated May 8, 1964, which plaintiff claimed was in default at the time foreclosure proceedings were started. Defendant appeared and answered that the plaintiff created the money and credit upon its own books by bookkeeping entry as the legal failure of consideration for the mortgage deed and alleged that the sheriff's sale passed no title to plaintiff. The issues tried to the jury were whether there were was a lawful consideration and whether defendant had waived his rights to complain about the consideration having paid on the note for almost three years. Mr. Morgan admitted that all of the money or credit which was used as a consideration was created upon their books, that this was standard banking practice exercised by their bank in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Another private bank, Further, that he knew of no United States uh, statute of law that gave the plaintiff the authority to do this. Plaintiff further claimed that defendant, by using the ledger book, created credit and by paying on the note and mortgage, waived any right to complain about the consideration and the defendant was stopped from doing so. At 12.15 on December 7, 1968, the jury returned a unanimous verdict for the defendant. 
Now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me pursuant to the Declaration of Independence, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution and law laws of the state Minnesota not inconsistent therewith, it is hereby ordered, adjudged, and decreed, 1. That plaintiff is not entitled to recover the possession of Lot 19, Fairview Beach, Scott County, Minnesota, according to the plot thereof on file in the Register of Deeds Office. 2. That because of failure of a lawful consideration, the note and mortgage dated May 8, 1964 are null and void. 3. That the sheriff's sale of the above described premises held on June 26, 1967 is null and void of no effect. 4. That plaintiff has no right, title, or interest in said premises or linen thereon as is above described. 5. That any provision in the Minnesota Constitution and any Minnesota statute limiting the jurisdiction of this court is repugnant to the Constitution of the United States and to the Bill of Rights of the Minnesota Construction Constitution and is null and void and that this court has jurisdiction to render complete justice in this cause. Six, that defendant is awarded costs in the sum of $75 and ex execution is hereby issued thereof. Seven, a 10-day stay is granted. 8. The following memorandum and any supplemental memorandum made and filed by this court in support of this judgment is hereby made a part hereof by reference. Dated December 9, 1968, by the court, Martin V. Mahoney, Justice of the Peace, Credit River Township, Scott County, Minnesota, Scott County, Minnesota. Memorandum. The issue in this case were simple. There was no material dispute on the facts for the jury to resolve. Plaintiff admitted that it, in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, which are for all practical purposes, because of their interlocking activity and practices, and both being banking institutions incorporated under the law of the United States, are in the law to be treated as one and the same bank did create the entire $14,000 in money or credit upon its own books by bookkeeping entry. That this was the consideration used to support the note dated May 8, 1964 and the mortgage of the same date. The money and credit first came into existence when they credited it. Mr. Morgan admitted that no United States law of statute existed which gave him the right to do this. A lawful consideration must exist and be tendered to support the note. C. Anheuser Bush Brewing Company versus Emma Mason, 44 Min 318, 46 Northwest uh, 558. The jury found there was no lawful consideration, and I agree. Only God can create something of value out of nothing. Even if defendant could be charged with waiver or estoppel, as a matter of law, this is no defense to the plaintiff. The law leaves wrongdoers where it finds them. See section 50, 51, and 52 of A.M. Juror Second Actions on page 584. No action will lie to recover on a claim based upon or in any manner depending upon a fraudulent illegal or immoral transaction or contract to which plaintiff was a party. Plaintiff's act of creating credit is not authorized by the Constitution and laws of the United States is unconstitutional and void and is not lawful consideration in the eyes of the law to support anything or upon which any lawful rights can be built. Nothing in the Constitution of the United States limits the jurisdiction of this court, which is one of original jurisdiction with right of trial by jury guaranteed. This is a common law action. Minnesota cannot limit or impair the power of this court to render complete justice between the parties. 
any provisions in the Constitution and law of Minnesota which attempt to do uh, so are repugnant to the Constitution for the United States and void. So questions as to the jurisdiction of this court are was raised by either party party at the trial. Both parties were given complete liberty to submit any and all facts and law to the jury, at least insofar as they saw fit. No complaint was made by plaintiff that plaintiff did not receive a fair trial uh, from the admission made by Mr. Morgan. The path of duty was made direct and clear for the jury. Their verdict uh, could not reasonably have been otherwise. Justice was rendered completely and without denial, promptly and without a delay, freely and without purchase, comfortable, com conformable to the law in this court on December 7, 1968. By the court, December 9, 1968. Martin versus Mahoney, Justice of the Peace, Credit River Township, Scott County, Minnesota. Note, it has never been doubted that a note given on a consideration which is prohibited by law is void. It has been determined, independent of acts of Congress, that sailing under the license of an enemy is illegal. The emission of bills of credit upon the books of these private corporations for the purposes of private gain is not warranted by the Constitution of the United States and is unlawful. See Craig versus M.O. 4 Peters Report 912. This court can tread only that path which is marked out by duty. N.V.M. Judge Martin Mahoney's decision was as follows. For the justice fees, the First National Bank deposited with the clerk of the district court the two Federal Reserve notes. The clerk tendered the notes to me. By my sworn duty compelled me to refuse the tender. This is con contrary to the Constitution of the United States. The states have no power to make bank notes a legal tender. See American Jur Jurist on Money, Section 13, only gold and silver coin is a lawful tender. Bank notes are a good tender as money unless specifically objected to. Their consent and usage is based upon the convertibility of such notes to coin at the pleasure of the holder upon presentation to the bank for redemption. When the inability of a bank to redeem its notes is openly avowed, they instantly lose their character as money and their circulation as currency ceases. C36 AM Juror on Money Section 9. There is no lawful consideration for these Federal Reserve notes to circulate as money. The banks actually obtain these notes for cost of printing. There is no lawful consideration for said notes. A lawful consideration must exist for a note. As a matter of fact, the notes are not notes at all as they contain no promise to pay. C. 17 American Jurist, Section 85215. The activity of the Federal Reserve Banks of Minnesota, San Francisco, and the First National Bank of Montgomery is contrary to public policy and contrary to the Constitution of the United States and constitutes an unlawful creation of money, credit, and the obtaining of money and credit for no valuable consideration. Activity of said bank in creating money and credit is not warranted by the Constitution of the United States. The Federal Reserve Banks and National Banks uh, exercise in an exclusive monopoly and privilege of creating credit and issuing their notes at the expense of the public, which does not receive a fair equivalent. This scheme is oblique obliquely designed for the benefit of an idle monopoly to rob, blackmail, and oppress the producers of wealth. The Federal Reserve Act and the National Bank Act is in their operation and effect contrary to the whole letter and spirit of the Constitution of the United States, for they confer an unlawful and unnecessary power on private parties. They hold all of our fellow citizens in dependence they are subversive to the rights and liberta liberation of the people. These acts have defiled the lawfully constituted government of the United States, the Federal Reserve Act and the National Banking Act, 
are not necessary and proper for carrying into execution the legislative powers granted to Congress or any other powers vested in the government of the United States, but, on the contrary, are subversive to the rights of the people in their rights to life, liberty, and property. See Section 462 of Title 31, U.S. Code. The meaning of the constitutional provision, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debt, is direct, clear, unambiguous, and without any qualification. This court is without authority to interpolate any exception. My duty is simply to execute it as written and to pronounce the legal result from an examination of the case of Edward v. Kearsey, 96 U.S. 595, the Federal Reserve notes, fiat money, which are attempted to be made a legal tender, are exactly what the authors of the Constitution of the United States intend to prohibit. No state can make these notes a legal tender. Congress is incompetent to authorize a state to make the note a legal tender for the effect of binding constitution provision C. Cook versus Iverson. This fraudulent Federal Reserve System and national banking system has no has impaired the obligation of contract, promoted disrespect for the Constitution and law, and has shaken society to its foundations. C96 U.S. Code 595 and 108M388N. 63M147. Title 31 U.S. Code Section 432 is a, in direct conflict with the Constitution insofar as le at least that it attempts to make Federal Reserve notes a legal tender. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Section 462 of Title 31 is not a law which is made in pursuance of the Constitution. It is unconstitutional and void, and I so hold. Therefore, the two Federal Reserve notes are null and void for any lawful purpose in so far as this case is concerned and are not a valid deposit of $2 with the clerk of the direct district court for the purpose of affecting an appeal from this court to the district court. However, there is a second ground of inv invalidity of these Federal Reserve notes previously discussed, and that is that the notes are invalid because on no theory are they based upon a valid, adequate, or lawful consideration. At the hearing scheduled for January 22, 1969, at 7 p.m., Mr. Morgan, nor anyone else from a uh, represent the bank, attended to aid the court in making a correct determination. Mr. Morgan appeared at the trial on December 7, 1969. He appeared as a witness to be candid, open, direct, experienced, and truthful. He testified to 20 years of experience with the Bank of America in Los Angeles, the Marquette National Bank of Minnesota, and the First National Bank of Minnesota. He seemed to be familiar with the operation of the Federal Reserve System. He freely admitted that his bank cre created all of the money and credit upon its books, with which it acquired the note and mortgage of May 8, 1964. The credit first came into existence when the bank created it upon its books. Further, he freely admitted that no United States law gave the bank the authority to do this. There was obviously no lawful consideration for the note. The bank parted with uh, absolutely nothing except a little ink. In this case, the evidence was on January 22, 1969, that the Federal Reserve Bank obtained the notes for the cost of the printing. Only this seems to be conferred by Title 12 U.S.C. Section 420. The cost is about nine-tenth of a cent per note. Regardless of the amount of the note, the Federal Reserve Bank Banks create all of the money and credit union, their books by bookkeeping ent entries by which they acquire United States and state securities. The collateral required to obtain the note is by Section 412 U.S.C. Title 12, a deposit 
of a like amount of bonds, bonds which the banks acquire by creating money and credit by bookkeeping entry. No rights can be acquired by fraud. The Federal Reserve notes are acquired through the use of unconstitutional unconstitutional statutes and fraud. The common law requires a lawful consideration for any contract or note. These notes are void for failure at a lawful consideration at common law, entirely apart from any constitutional consideration. Considerations upon this ground, the notes are ineffectual for any purpose. This seems to be the pr principal objection to paper fiat money and the cause of its uh, depreciation and failure down through the ages. If allowed to continue, Federal Reserve notes we will meet the same fate. From the evidence introduced on January 22, 1969, this court finds that as of March 18, 1968, all gold and silver backing is removed from Federal Reserve notes. The law leaves wrongdoers where it finds them. See Armour Juror's Second and Actions, Section 50, 51, and 52, Slavery and All Its Incidents, including Peonage, Trostum, and Debt Created by Fraud is universally prohibited by, in the United States. This case represents but another refined form of slavery by the bankers. Their position is not supported by the Constitution of the United States. The people have spoken their will in terms which cannot be misunderstood. It is indispensable to the preservation of the union and the independence and liberties of the people that this court adhere only to the mandates of the Constitution and administer it as it is written. I, therefore, hold these notes in question void and not effectual for any purpose. January 30th. 1969, by the court, uh, Martin v. Mahoney, Martin v. Mahoney, Justice of the Peace, Credit River Township, Scott County, Minnesota. If we are a nation only had a few of these remarkable men in the ju judiciary, we cannot even imagine the pro uh, prosperity we would enjoy. Judge Mahoney died of a mysterious cause several months after this decision. The American people held as collateral. Why does there, why does there exist within the borders of the United States of America a system that appears to be predicated upon the enslavement of its citizens for the benefit of the favored few international bankers? Perhaps we should revisit the time period of 1933 for the answer. Perpetual bankruptcy for America. Soon after the federal government's departure from common law in 1938, the United States entered the Second World War. The League of Nations was reinstituted under the pre pretense of the United Nations. 22nd USCA 287ETSEQ, the Bank of Bank for International Settlements, was reinstituted under pretense of the Boston or Bretton Woods Agreement, 60 Stat. 1401-22-USCA-286-ET-SEQ as the International Monetary Fund, the Fund and the International Bank for uh, Reconstruction and Development, the Bank, the United States as a corporate body, politic, an official ent ent entity, emerged from World War II in worse economic condition than when it entered. In 1950, again, the U.S. declared bankruptcy and reorganization. The reorganization is located on in Title V of United States Code, annotated. The explanation of the beginning of 5 USCA is immensely informative. The Secretary of Treasury was appointed as the receiver in bankruptcy. Uh, reorganization Plan Number 265 USCA 903 Public Law 94564 Legislative History Page 5967. The United States subsequently and periodically filed uh, further reorganizations. Conditions and situations worsened, and Congress, having done what they were co commanded not to do, Madison's Note, Constitutional Convention, August 16, 1787, Federalist Papers, number 44 in 1965, passed the Coinage Act, completely debasing the constitutional coin, 
gold and silver in uh, IE dollar, 18 USCA 331 and 332 US versus Marigold, 50 US 560, 13 LED 257. At the signing of the Coinage Act on July 23, 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson stated in his press release, when I have signed the, this bill before me, we will have made the first fundamental change in our coinage in 173 years. The Coinage Act of 1965 supersedes the Act of 1792, and that act has had the title an act establishing a mint and regulating the coinage of the United States. Now, I will sign this bill to make the first change in our coinage system since the 18th century. To those members of Congress who are here on this historic occasion, I want to assure you that in making this change from the 18th century, we have no idea of returning to it. It is important to take full cognizance, cognizance of the fact that no constitutional amendment was ever obtained to fundamentally change, amend, abridge, or abolish the constitutional mandates, provisions, or prohibitions contained in the organic constitution for the United States regarding our money. But due to internal and external pressures and divisions surrounding the Vietnam conflict, etc., the usurpation and breach of their constitutional mandate, Congress actions went basically unchallenged and unnoticed by the general public at large. They, the de jure people of the United States of America, that they became a wealthy man's cannon fodder or cheap source of slave labor. Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, uh, TMSW 7905, Dot one pages six through thirteen fifty six Congress is clearly mandated the power and authority to regulate and maintain true and inherent value of the coin within the scope and authority of Article One, Section Eight, Clause Five and Six, Article One, Section Ten, Clause One of the Ordained Constitution, seventeen eighty seven. Further, Congress had a corresponding obligation to maintain gold and silver coin and foreign coin at the necessary and proper equal weights and measures clause public law 297-289-96 stat 1211. These exercising the public offices of the union states all new such de facto transactions, transactions were unlawful and unauthorized. Regardless, they sanctioned, implemented, and enforced the complete destruction of the American people's wealth inevitably returning resulting in destructive governmental social and in, industrial economic change in the de jure states of the united states of america public law 94564 legislative history pages 5936 5945 31 usca 314 31 usca 321 and 31 usca 5112 under the delusion that they may Lawmakers now, as they in, then, both directly and indirectly, continue to do with impunity what they are absolutely prohibited from doing. Federalist Paper Number Forty Four, Craig versus Missouri, Four Peters, Nine O Three. The international bankers and corporations take control of America. In 1966, Congress, being then as severely com compromised by campaign contributions from banks and corporations as they are now passed the Federal Tax Linen Act, Lean Act, by which the entire taxing and monetary system, the essential engine, the Federalist Paper Number 31, was placed under the Uniform Commercial Code, Public Law 89719, Legislative History, pages 3722. The Uniform Commercial Code was promulgated by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws in collusion with the American Law Institute for the benefit of banking and business interests. Handbook of the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, 1966, pages 152 and 153. The United States became engaged in numerous conflicts, including Korea and the Vietnam. 
that were under the direction and control of the United Nations, 22 U.S.C.A. 287. The Congress agreed to foot the bill, 22 U.S.C.A. 287, not being able to honor their obligations. Congress rehypothecated debt credit openly and publicly dishonored and disavowed their notes and obligations at 12 U.S.C.A. 411, i.e. Federal Reserve Notes, through Public Law 90-269, Section 2, 82, Stat 50, 1968, to wit. Section 2, the first sentence of Section 15 of the Federal Reserve Act, 12 U.S.C. 391, is amended by stri uh, striking, striking and the funds provided in the Act for the redemption of Federal Reserve notes. Our Republic began to crumble on March 28, 1970. President Richard M. Nixon issued Proclamation Number 3972 declaring an emergency because the postal employees struck against the de facto government for higher pay due to inflation on the paper bills of credit. Senate Report Number 93549, page 5. Uh, 96. President Nixon then placed the U.S. Postal Department under control of the Department of Defense, Department of the Army Field Manual, AFM 41-10-1969 ED. The Federal Reserve System's reserve policy had been faltering for more than a decade, but the benchmark date of the collapse is put on August 15, 1971. On that day, President Nixon reversed U.S. international monetary policy by officially declaring the non-convertibility of the U.S. dollar, FRN, into gold. Public Law 94564, Legislative History, page 5937, the Senate Report Number 93549, forward page 3, Proclamation Number 4, uh, 074 pages 597, 31 USCA 314 and 31 USCA 5112. There was simply no longer any gold left in Fort Knox, which with which to pay the country's international debt to its foreign creditors. You know why? The chapter is coming up. On September 21st, 1973, Congress passed Public Law 93110, amending the Bretton Woods. Par Value Modification Act, 92 Stat, 116, 31 USCA, 449, and reiterated the emergency at 12 USCA, 95A, and amended Section 8 of the Bretton Woods Agreement Act of 1945. 22 USCA, 286, which included reports on foreign currency transactions. Also see Executive Order Number 10033. This act further declared in action to be that the provision of any law in effect on the date of enactment of this act and no rule, regulation, or order under authority of any such law may be construed to prohibit any person from pursuing, holding, selling, or otherwise dealing with gold. The United Nations, good versus or evil. On January 19th, 1976, Congresswoman Majori S. Holt noted for the record a second Declaration of Independence, which clearly identified the UN as a communist organization. The UN seeking both production and monetary control over the union and the people using the international organization, UN, by promoting the One World Order Congressional Record, 9, January 19, 1976. Extension of remarks also see 8 USCA 110140, 50 USCA 781, and 783. First, the federal judges roll over for their 20 pieces of the silver. Social and economic conditions steadily worsened, as note, noted in the complaint petition filed in the U.S. Court of Claims, docket number 41 to uh, 76 on February 11, 1976, by 44 federal judges Atkins A, et al. versus U.S. Atkins complained that as a result of inflation, the compensation of federal judges has been substantially diminished each year since 1969. 
causing direct and continuing monetary harm to plaintiffs. The real value of the dollar decreased by approximately 34.5% from March 15, 1969 to October 1, 1975. As a result, plaintiffs have suffered a, an unconstitutional deprivation of earnings and in the prayer for relief claimed damages for, for the constitutional violations enumerated above, measured as diminution of his earnings for the entire period since, since 19, uh, March 9th, 1969. It is quite apparent that the persons holding the enjoying offices of public trust, honor, and or profit knew of the emergency and emergent problem, they thought protection for themselves to the damage and injury of we the people and our children we were classified as a club that has many other members who have no remedy. Knowing that heinous, heinous acts had, had been committed, the judges stated that they, judges, lawyers, would not apply the law nor would any substantive remedy be applied until all of us judges are dead. Such persons fraudulently swore on an oath to uphold, defend, and preserve the sovereignty of the nation and the republic states of the Union and the Constitution. They breached their duty to protect the citizens and their posterity from fraud, imposition, avarice, and stealthy encroachment, Atkins et al. Vell, U.S. 556-F2D-1028, pages 1072 and 1074, The Attempting of America, Supra, pages 155-159, 5 U.S.C.A. 5305 and 5035, Senate Report Number 93-59. 549 pages 69 to 71. This is verified in public law number 94 564, legislative history pages 5944, and states. Moving to a floating exchange rate for international commerce means private enterprise and not central governments bear the risk of currency fluctuations. Numerous serious debts debates were held in Congress including, but not limited to, Tuesday, July 27, 1976, Congressional Record House, July 27, 1976, concerning the international financial institutions and operations. Representative Ron Paul, chairman of the House Banking Committee, made numerous references to the true practices of the international financial institutions, including, but not limited to, the conversion of $27 million dollars uh, in gold today, that's $9.5 billion in FRN as factoring the price of gold at $352 per ounce, contributed by the United States as per part of its quota obligations when the International Monetary Fund Governor Secretary of Treasury sold public law 94-564 legislative history pages 5945 and 5946 under questionable terms and concessions. See also the Ron Paul Money Book, 1991 by Ron Paul Plantation Publishing, uh, 837 W Plantation, Clute, Texas 77531. Invisible contracts you have with the Secretary of the Treasury for the use of the Federal Reserve's private money. On uh, October 28, 1977, the passage of Public Law 95-147, 91 Stat 1. 227 declared most banking institutions, including state banks, to be under direction and control of the corporate governor of the International Monetary Fund, Public Law 94564, Legislative History, pages 5942, United States Government Manual 1990 uh, and, one, and 91, pages 480 to 481. The Act further declared. 2. Section 10A of the Gold Reserve Act of 1934-31-USC-8822-AB is amended by striking out the phrase stabilizing the exchange value of the dollar. C. The joint resolution entitled Joint Resolution to Assure Uniform Value to the Coins and Currencies of the United States approved June 5th 
1933, 31 U.S.C. 463 shall not apply to obligations issued on or after the date of enactment of this section. The international organizations, corporations, and associations could not pay and refuse to pay their debt. They determined that they could pass the loss of their non-redeemable, non-current notes, bonds, and evidences of debt off onto others and thereby crown their fraud with success. Letter from Department of Treasury, Russell L. Hunk, Assistant General Counsel, International Affairs, October 26, 1989, as recorded in the Office of Clerk and Rec Recorder, Becca County, uh, Colorado, at Book 540, page uh, 364, the de facto United States as corporator, corporators, 22 U.S.C.A. 286 uh, E. at Sec. and State had declared insolvency, 26 U.S.C. 1651 G1, Westfall versus Bra Bralev, 10 Ohio, 188-75 AMDC, December uh, 509, Adams versus Richardson, 337-SW-2D-911, Ward versus Smith, 7-Wall-447. In 1980, Congress passed, among other things, Public Law 96-221, providing for the furtherance and expansion of the profigate the uh, uh, profigate rehypothecated debt pyramid scheme and reduce the reserve requirements on transaction accounts to a minimum of 3% to a maximum of 14%. Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980, Section 103B-E-2. Uh, and you thought it was money. In the United States, neither paper currency nor debts Deposits have value as commodities. Intrinsically, a dollar bill is just a piece of paper. Deposits are merely book entries. Coins do have some intrinsic value as metal, but generally far less than their face amount. In the absence of legal reserve requirements, banks can build up deposits by increasing loans and investments so long as they keep enough currency on hand to redeem whatever amounts uh, the holders of deposits want deposits want to convert into currency. This unique attribute of the banking business was discovered several centuries ago. At one time, bankers were merely middlemen. They made profit by accepting gold and coin, uh, gold and coins brought to them for safekeeping and lending them to borrowers, but they soon found that the receipts they issued to depositors were being used as money since whoever held them could go to the bankers and banker and exchange them for metallic money. Then bankers discovered that they could make loans merely by giving borrowers their promise to pay banknotes. In this way, banks began to create money. More notes could be issued than the gold and coin on hand because only a portion of the notes outstanding would be presented for payment at any one time. Enough metallic money had to be kept on hand. Of course, the, to redeem whatever volume of notes was presented for payment. Transaction deposits are the modern counterpart of bank notes. It was a small step from printing notes to making book entries to the credit of borrowers, which the borrowers in turn could spend by writing checks, thereby printing their own money. Modern money mechanics, a workbook on deposits, currency, and bank reserves, 1982 REV ED, ED Federal Reserve Bank, of Chicago, P.O. Box 834, Chicago, Illinois, 60609, pages 3 and 4. An old Cold War rages against the American people. 86 years is no in no way temporary. It is a permanent state of emergency and was clearly instituted, formed, and engineered within the Union for the sole purpose of creating a constitutional dictatorship, all accomplished 
through gross usurpation and breach of legal duties and through the president's use of executive orders on demand of the international financial institutions, organizations, corporations, and associations, including the Federal Reserve, their physical and depository agent, 22 USCA 8286D. This profligate practice has led to such emergency legislation as the Public Debt Limit Balance Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act of 1985, Public Law 99-177, etc. The government, by becoming a corporation, 22 USCA 286, lays down its sovereignty and takes on the mantle of a private citizen. It can exercise no power which is not derived from the corporate charter, the Bank of the United States versus Planters Bank of Georgia, 6 L E D 9 V 244 U.S. versus Burr 309 U.S. 242. The real party in interest is not the du jour United States of America or state, but the bank and the fund. The 22 USCA 286 at SEQ, this act committed under fraud, force, and seizures are many times done under letters of mark, marque, and reprisal, i.e. Re recapture. 31 USCA 5323, which principles as fraud and justice never dwell together. Wingate's maxims 680 and a right of action cannot rise arise out of fraud. Broom's Maxim 297-729, Corper Reports 343, 5 Scott's New Report 558, 10 Mass 276, uh, 38 FED, 800 are far too high a thought concept for these internationalists as is due process or just compensation and justice itself forget about truth. Will Rogers' old saying, there are men running government who couldn't, shouldn't be allowed to play with matches, is just as astute and accurate today as it was then. The contrived emergency was created numerous abuses, usurpations, and uh, abridgments of delegated powers and authority, as stated in uh, Senate Report 93 549. Since March 9, 1993, United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. In fact, there are now, in effect, four presidential proclaimed states of national emergency in addition to the national emergency declared by President Roosevelt in 1933. There are also the national emergency proclaimed by President Truman on December 16, 1930, during the Korean conflict and the states of national emergency declared by President Nixon on March 23, 1970 and August 15, 1971. These proclamations give force, force to four seven provisions of federal law. These hundreds of stat, stat, statutes delegate to the president extraordinarily powers ordinarily exercised by the Congress, which affect the lives of American citizens in a host of all encompassing manners. This vast range of powers taking, taken together confers enough authority to rule the country without reference to normal constitutional process. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the president may seize property, organize and control the means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, seize and control all transportation and communication, regulate and operate of private enterprise, restrict travel, and in a plethora of particular ways, control the lives of American citizens. Forward, page three. The introduction on page one began with a phen phenomenal declaration. A majority of the people of the United States have lived all of their lives under emergency rule for 40 years. Freedoms and governmental procedures guaranteed by the Constitution have in varying degrees been abridged by laws brought into force by states of national emergency. According to all my research of 16 American jurisprudence, 
a second edition, section 71 and 82, no emergency justifies a violation of any constitutional provision, arguing the supremacy clause and separation of powers is clearly admitted in Senate Report Number 93-549 that abridgment has clearly occurred. We have all heard on numerous occasions statements in federal and state tribunals that constitutional arguments are immaterial or frivolous. That is based upon the concealment, furtherance, and compounding of fraud and emergency created and sustained by the expatriated aliens of the United Nations and its organizations, corporations, and associations. Uh, letters, Letter Inside Magazine, February 18th, uh, 1991, page 7, Lowell uh, L. Flanders, President, UN Staff Union, um, New York, uh, 8 USCA 1481 is one of the controlling statutes uh, on expiration, as is 22 USCA 611, 612, and 613, and 50 USCA 781. This is where the federal government gets jurisdiction over you because you have an invisible contract with the Secretary of the Treasury in the form of bank accounts, credit cards, social security particip participation, etc. Contract law is equity uh, Emirati jurisdiction and the Constitution is of no use to you in those courts. Conspiracy theories, delusional or real. Unlike the government, I permit my readership the right to determine for themselves whether or not there exists a conspiracy in this country. My views on the subject are totally irrelevant. You know on which side of the road I stand. Where is the money? Where does the money go that is paid into the IRS? It depends at least a year in what is called a quad zero account under the individual uh, master file, with, after which name the director of the IRS center can apparently do whatever he wants with the money. It is sometimes dispersed under Treasury Order 91 Rev 1, May 12, 1986, which is a service agreement between the IRS and the Agency of Internal Development, AID, United Nations.